Yes, I was um, at the University of Copenhagen, but currently uh, with UNU Wider in Mozambique. Um, that's always the danger of talking a little bit about work that's been completed because things do change. Uh, and that's particularly relevant actually in the case of Mozambique. So for those of you who are familiar with Mozambique, um, two or three years ago, we were having one conversation and now we're having um, a rather different conversation. Um, so unfortunately, uh, this work has not fully updated, unlike William, I didn't have the chance to fully update this uh, analysis. Um, but I will uh, try and speak a little bit about, you know, what do we, what do we know, what, what, uh, what can we update given the crisis that Mozambique has recently faced. Um, nonetheless, um, I would say, and I think related to the, the previous uh, speaker, um, despite the challenges that Mozambique has faced over the last couple of years, I'll, I will talk briefly about that. The data, our database to make additional analysis has not changed. So we're still working with household survey data collected in 2014, 2015, um, whereas we're sitting today at the end of 2018 and a lot has changed. So that's a, a general point, I think, of relevance, uh, not just for Mozambique, but in other countries. Um, so just a little brief motivation. I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to be uh, skipping through these uh, slides relatively quickly. Uh, Mozambique, at, at least to 2016, has been one of the you know, regional uh, growth performers, uh, emerging from a post-conflict um, experience until the early 1990s and sustaining rapid growth um, throughout, really the, the, throughout the rest of the 1990s and 2000s. Um, at the same time, and like many other um, sub-Saharan African countries, so Mozambique is certainly not unique, there has been a concern that the growth has not been accompanied by what some people would call growth-enhancing structural transformation. And I will comment on, on what, that, what that is or, or how we might go about defining that. Um, and I think this chimes with some of the other chapters in the book uh, in many ways. So just briefly, on the, for those of you not familiar with the Mozambican experience, so uh, Mozambique went through very uh, choppy times in the 1980s associated with, uh, with internal conflict. Um, but then um, the, the conflict ceased in the early 1990s. And as you can see from the green bars, there's been consistent growth essentially since then. Um, and that has continued to date. We have, I mean, despite a crisis, um, there has not been a, a full-blown recession. Um, the, uh, the macroeconomic um, environment has uh, substantially improved over this period. Um, we've seen uh, reductions in inflation consistent with a, a moderation in many other um, parts of the world as well. Um, increasing foreign direct investment. And as you can see in the latest period, uh, admittedly the data is a little bit old, uh, you can see that the 30% of GDP in FDI in the 2010 to 13 period. Um, you know, some improvement in, in exports um, and uh, improvement in, in the fiscal position of the government as well. Uh, leading to a reduction in reliance on foreign aid. Mozambique was one of the countries most reliant on foreign aid um, and that's no longer the case anymore. Um, although foreign aid has been substantial. Accompanying this, there have been a series of what you might call microeconomic questions in the sense that while there has been progress on many indicators, certainly uh, the progress has been less inspiring, particularly when we're looking at things like, um, thing, things like uh, poverty reduction or consumption poverty. Um, for instance, if you look at uh, panel B here in the slide, you can see that consumption poverty um, fell in the um, early part of this period, so then from 1996 to 2002, um, but, has, but from 2002 to 2008 did not fall substantially. And we do have updated figures to 2014. This shows uh, some reduction in poverty, but again, not perhaps as inspiring or as robust as one would have wished. So what we uh, wanted to do really in this paper was look at what's been happening in the labor market. You know, to what extent has the macroeconomic success been accompanied by structural changes in the use of labor through the economy? Um, I think this is important uh, really from the point of view of just having a, 
um, as best um, or as careful as possible descriptive or diagnostic analysis of what's going on. I think it's very easy uh, to jump to conclusions or causes or look at, look at, oh, this intervention works or doesn't work, but if we don't have a, a reasonably detailed diagnostic study of what's going on, uh, it can be very difficult to fit that into the bigger picture. Um, the challenge, as in other data poor environments, is, is a, it has been a lack of data, uh, and that, that continues uh, to be the case to some extent. So to do an employment or labor market analysis, we've really had to rely on the series of household surveys, which have limitations when it comes to the, the amount of data in terms of employment, and also the consistency in which that's been collected. Unfortunately, the, the, the surveys haven't been 100% consistent in terms of the, the sectoral classifications and so, and, and so forth that have been used. So that does create a number of difficulties in, in just putting together a consistent picture. Nonetheless, we've done our best. So what do we see in terms of GDP trends? So this is not labor, this is output. And, and as you can see, uh, broadly consistent with, with, the, with what we've been hearing uh, throughout the conference, actually, is this reduction in, uh, in, in the share of GDP in agriculture, um, an increase uh, or you know, a, certainly a strong uh, role for, um, for services, actually, throughout the period, if you can see there, that really almost throughout the period, we've seen 50% of GDP has been uh, through services. Uh, and a moderate role for, for, for manufacturing. Um, that, that did actually increase um, in the middle of the period substantially, but that was really related to uh, one or two very specific um, high capital intensive FDI projects. Um, if we then compare that with labor market trends, um, we see, uh, you know, again, an interesting dynamic. We see once more the, I mean, the dominant role of agriculture uh, from 83% to 72% of, of all employment. Uh, so agriculture does remain the dominant uh, way in which people are earning a living in Mozambique. Um, and, but combined with that, where have people gone, if not in agriculture? Well, they've basically gone to services. So again, the, or the, the shift or the new entrance in the labor market, of course, we're not tracking people over time, so we can't tell you whether they've been shifting so much. But we do know that... that, that as a share of employment, services has doubled um, over this period of time. So what does this mean in terms of labor productivity? So what we can do, I mean, it's very simple, is just look at, well, what is the, 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 the relative productivity of labor in different sectors? Uh, and what we see is not a, a, not a narrowing of relative labor productivity. This is relative to the average. We find an a, a dispersion, an increasing dispersion of labor productivity. So, uh, for instance, w what's quite interesting is looking at the mining sector, is we see that mining has dramatically increased its labor productivity relative to other sectors. Uh, but if we just go back one, uh, one slide, relatively, it's actually reduced its share of labor. We also see, uh, in some cases, in, in the case of agriculture, also a declining relative productivity of labor. So we're not seeing a clear, a clear narrowing of labor productivity across the economy. Um, another way to look at that is to look at which sectors have increased their labor share uh, and then which sectors have increased their labor productivity. And this is an, this is an interesting, uh, uh, a relatively simple thing to do, but it does draw out a, a few uh, important trends. So let's look at services. So the change in labor share um, in, uh, in percentage points of the labor force uh, in services in 97 to 05 um, was uh, positive. And the mean, sorry, this is relative, this is the mean, this isn't the change in productivity, this is its relative labor productivity versus the mean was just above 100. And as you can see, in the later period, 2006 to 2014, we have a larger increase in the labor share but a fall in its relative labor productivity. So we see the point here, I think, to make it a bit more simple, is to note sectors that are gaining workers, relatively speaking, are the ones that are falling in terms of productivity. So average productivity is falling in sectors which are expanding in terms of labor, basically. When we see the opposite in terms of mining, 
uh, which is interesting here. We see mining, which consistent with the previous graph, we see mining falling in its relative labor share, but increasing in its la relative labor productivity. And so it's moving that direction. Um, so as you can see, this is presenting a number of interesting dynamics and challenges. Um, I'm not sure we're in a position where we can suddenly, we, we can definitively state what the causes are, but at least this helps us to think through what are the potential sets of causes. Um, I will now skip the, I think uh, we can do this in a bit more of a formal way, and for those of you who are interested, I would just point you to the paper where we go through uh, a standard decomposition method that takes you through how to, how to tease out the different, uh, different contributions to changes in labor productivity over time. I don't think I'll uh, bother with that right now. So what does this mean in terms of findings? And that's kind of what we're here for, I guess, is we know that Mozambique's labor force does remain dependent on low productivity agriculture with the productivity, uh, the relative productivity of agriculture declining over time. Uh, we've see, do, we do see some intersectoral labor movement, uh, but that's been dominated by movement uh, or new entrants into the services sector. Um, <coughs> we do see some productivity growth, uh, but this is mainly within sector growth. Um, and this seems to be slowing over time. So this, this is the result of this decomposition. Um, and in a sense, what, we've, what we see is a, is a kind of a negative dynamic reallocation effect. So as I said before, sectors which are, which are gaining workers are declining in their relative productivity. Uh, and as a result, you might say that there, there therefore is a limited contribution of structural change or structural change has not been growth enhancing uh, in one definition. So this leads to briefly some kind of reflections looking forward. So my la last few minutes um, is what are the policy challenges? Well, the, the, a huge policy challenge in Mozambique is demographics. So, so the, uh, the fertility rate or population growth remains very robust, very, very high, in fact. Uh, and so what we're going to see, you know, inbuilt in the mechanism of demographic change is that over the next 30 years, there's going to be a very large number of, in, of, of individuals entering the labor market. And given current levels of education, many of these are going to be um, of a rel relatively low, low qualified or low education. Uh, um, what we did actually in, the, in this paper is we looked at some of the best and worst case possible scenarios for expansion of education across the population. Um, and so what we looked at is we basically said, well, let's imagine that we took the, you know, the, the best experience that has occurred in the past 30 years, uh, and let's, let's, let's assume Mozambique achieves that in terms of expanding education, in terms of years of schooling. What would, we, what would it look at? What would it look like? And this would be the, and so this gives us a confidence interval saying kind of best and worst case scenarios, right? And so the best case scenario is the top end of that gray uh, interval in the first uh, bar, and what you can see there is that even by 2040, you know, the average level of education in a best, best case scenario is around seven years. So we're still saying that on average, in a best case scenario, on average, workers have a primary education. Best case scenario. Worst case scenario, it's substantially lower than that, right? So it's, you know, less than six years of education. So of course, these are the, this is a, a fundamental policy challenge that, that Mozambique faces. I'm not going to say I have a solution, but I think we need to know what the challenges are before we even pretend to make policies. Um, let me just briefly, because I know the time is ticking, what is the update? So the update on this, and this is only a slide, so that uh, indicates that I haven't had sufficient time to fully work on this, is that Mozambique has experienced a debt crisis since 2016. Uh, the details of that go beyond what we can discuss here, but it does reveal that what we thought was an improving uh, policy environment clearly had fragilities. Um, what this has led to is a reduction in, in growth, high inflation, substantial depreciation, and a reduction in aid. The situation today, as of 2018, is stabilizing, although we do have some evidence of higher unemployment that comes from a manufacturing survey that uh, was undertaken last year. Um, but interestingly enough, also no evidence of a substantive shift in the policy or economic structure in response to the crisis that could simply reflect the high levels of uncertainty. Uh, but and at the same time, we see the, 
the economy and also the political economy is, it is treading water until natural gas revenues arrive. Um, whether they will arrive and at what time, however, remains largely uncertain. Uh, and certainly the, the direction of policy now in Mozambique is, is very much focused on what's going to happen with natural gas and natural gas extraction. Uh, the threat in this, in, I mean, I think we can maybe discuss this later in the, in the, in, 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 in the, uh, in the panel, but I think the threat here is, does Mozambique enter a kind of a, an Angola, Nigeria type direction, which I think unfortunately would be the default uh, scenario, in which you still find m the majority of workers in low productivity agriculture, particularly in Mozambique's case. Uh, but what would be the opportunity? Two minutes, and it's the last slide. So the opportunity would be perhaps thinking strategically, at least assuming this, this natural gas revenue comes online, could there be distributional policies, a UBI or a universal basic share uh, that our speakers this morning spoke of, and how could that update or reinvigorate the employment situation? Uh, these are questions that we're thinking about, we're debating in Mozambique, uh, but of course we would love your input as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.